Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 6 is titled Laying Up Treasure in Heaven and is read in preparation for teaching on Sabbath, February 11. Sabbath afternoon, February 4. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're opening your word again and we just thank you for it because it brings to us the knowledge that you want to impart to us, but it also brings the salvation that comes to us because of the death of your Son, Jesus. And as we open your word this week, we pray that the Holy Spirit will guide our thinking and our thoughts and our understanding that we may walk with you as you would have us walk. And today I'd particularly like to pray for those in Kangaroo Flat in Victoria and Womberal in New South Wales in Australia and Sandra Turner-Reed and Jay Wynn in Massachusetts in the United States and Charlotte Gordon and Nicolodia in Jamaica and Lister Brake in uh, Trinidad and Tobago and um, Kenya Hasisi and Nuru Nathu in Kenya and Serena Shabangu in South Africa. And Lord, wherever people are listening, I pray that their needs may be filled because of your grace and your love. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's read that again. Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus gave us the world's best investment strategy when he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. That's from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Jesus concludes in the next verse his investment strategy by saying, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, show me what you spend your money on and I will show you where your heart is. Because wherever you put your money, your heart is sure to follow if it's not there already. Do you want a heart for the kingdom of God? If so, then put your money where it will reap eternal rewards. Put your time and your money and prayer into God's work. If you do, you will soon become even more interested in that work and your heart will follow as well. This week, we will review texts and illustrations that show us how to store up treasures in heaven and ultimately reap an eternal reward. Sunday, February 5. Noah found grace. It is noteworthy to consider that those who are seeking heavenly treasure are frequently called by God to make major life alterations here on earth. Be prepared to face the same thing, if need be. Read Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 14. What radical changes came into Noah's life as a result of obeying God? What principles can we find here for ourselves in a world that needs to be warned about impending doom? Genesis 6, beginning at verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Noah could have spent his time and resources building a home for himself, but he chose to make a drastic change in his life and to spend 120 years of that life in following the call of God to build the ark. Many sceptics today dismiss the story of the flood as a myth, often based on scientific speculations about the known laws of nature. There is nothing new. The world before the flood, we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 96, reasoned that for centuries the laws of nature had been fixed. The recurring seasons had come in their order. Heretofore, rain had never fallen. The earth had been watered by a mist or dew. The rivers had never yet passed their boundaries, but had borne their waters safely to the sea. Fixed decrees had kept the waters from overflowing their banks. End of quote. Before the flood, people argued that a flood could never come based on a faulty understanding of reality. After the flood, based on a faulty understanding of reality, they argued that it never came to begin with. As the Bible says, there is nothing new under the sun. And that's from Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. Meanwhile, the Bible also says that people will be sceptical of end-time events, as they were of the flood, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that, by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. How can we then prepare for the coming destruction? There is a conscious decision called delayed gratification. This basically means that we should patiently do the work God has called us to do in the hope of a more glorious future reward. We don't know when Christ will return. In one sense, it doesn't matter. What matters instead is that, like Noah, we do what God asks of us in the meantime even if, as with Noah, it means some radical life changes. And so to finish today, how ready would you be to make a major change in your life for God if, like Noah, you were called to do just that? Hint. See Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Monday, February 6. Abram, the father of the faithful. God called Abram to leave his homeland and his kinfolk and to go to a land that he would show them. Thus began the bloodline of the Messiah. Though details aren't given, Abram had to leave the land of his birth and early years. Surely it wasn't an easy decision and no doubt he gave up some earthly pleasure and conveniences to do it. 
Read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. How were all the families of the earth blessed as a result of this promise and its acceptance? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was a major life-changing event for Abram and his family. By faith, we read in Hebrews 11.8, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 126, Abraham's unquestioning obedience is one of the most striking evidences of faith to be found in all the Bible. End of quote. Most of us would not be eager to leave our homeland and our friends and family members, but Abram did so. Abram was satisfied to be where God wanted him to be. As strange as this may seem, Abram, Isaac and Jacob never received that land in their lifetimes. Yet they remained faithful to God anyway. Read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 13. What is the relevant message to us here? Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. But he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Abram was known as a prince by those living around him. He was known to be generous, brave, hospitable, and a servant of the Most High God. His witness for God was exemplary. By the grace of God, we are heirs with Abraham. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. That's from Galatians 3, verses 6 and 7. And then verse 29, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. With Abraham, as with Noah, we see someone making a major life-changing decision as a result of obeying God. And so to finish the day, read 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18. How should the message of this verse impact the kind of spiritual decisions that we make? How did both Moses and Abraham follow that same principle? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18 While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Tuesday, February 7, Lot's Bad Decisions When Abram left his homeland in response to God's call, his nephew Lot chose to go with him on his pilgrimage. Genesis chapter 13 records that God blessed Abram to the point that he was very rich in cattle, the primary measure of wealth in that culture, in silver and in gold, in Genesis chapter 13 verse 2. 
Lot also had flocks and herds and tents, we read in verse 5. They both became so wealthy with their extensive livestock herds that they could not dwell close together. In order to avoid strife between their herdsmen, Abram offered Lot the choice of where he would like to live. Of course, Lot should have deferred to Abram, his senior, and because he owed his own prosperity to his connection to him. However, he showed no gratitude to his benefactor and selfishly wanted what he considered the best land available. Read Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 to 12. What rational factors could have led Lot to make the decision that he did? Genesis 13, beginning at verse 10, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. However easily Lot could have justified his decision to move to the city, things didn't turn out so great for him there, and when Abram heard about what happened to him, he didn't say, well, too bad, Lot. You reap what you sow. Instead, he came to his rescue, as we read in chapter 14 of Genesis. And let's read this chapter. It's 24 verses, but the story is important. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shina, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is, Zoah. All these joined together in the valley of Sidom, that is, the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim in ashtaroth Carnaim, and Zuzim in Ham, and Emim in sheva Kariathim, and the Horites in their mountain of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En-Mishpat, that is, Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazazon, Tamar. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoah, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Sidom against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shina, and Arioch, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidom was full of asphalt pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Abna, and they were allies with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods, and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Shedeloma, and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. 
and he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Ana, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion." Sometimes in our quest for more stuff, we don't learn our lessons well. Lot moved right back into Sodom, but in his great mercy, God sent messengers of warning to Lot and his family, letting them know of the pending destruction of these cities. Now read Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 to 33. What did God tell Abraham was the reason for his visit to earth? What was Abraham's response to the news that God was planning to destroy these wicked cities? Genesis 18, beginning at verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord, and Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked? Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the fifty righteous. Would you destroy all the city for lack of five? So he said, if I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be forty found there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of forty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Indeed now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord Suppose twenty should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of twenty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Because of Abraham's concern for Lot and his family, he bargained with God to spare the cities if righteous people could be found in them. He started with fifty and went down to ten. In harmony with his character of love, God never stopped granting mercy until Abraham stopped asking. God and the two angels personally delivered Lot, his wife, and their two daughters, but his wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Lot entered Sodom, a wealthy man, and came out with almost nothing. How careful we need to be about the kind of decisions that we make, especially thinking only of short-term gains, in contrast to the big picture. And we'll finish today with Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Wednesday, February 8 from Deceiver to Prince. 
As a young man who loved and feared God, Jacob nevertheless stooped to conspire with his mother Rebekah to deceive his father and gain his blessing. As a consequence, he started his adult life on the wrong path, having to flee or perhaps face an early death. Rebecca told Jacob to flee thou to Laban and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. Then I will send and fetch thee. That story is in Genesis 27 verses 43 to 45. Jacob was actually gone for 20 years and he never saw his mother's face again. Read Genesis chapter 32 verses 22 to 31. What happened here to Jacob and what spiritual lessons can we take from this story about God's grace even when we make wrong decisions? Genesis 32, beginning at verse 22, And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Through humiliation, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 197 and 198, repentance and self-surrender, this sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. He had fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God, and the heart of infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. The error that had led to Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. Jacob had received the blessing for which his soul had longed. His sin as a supplanter and deceiver had been pardoned. End of quote. Read Genesis chapter 49 verses 29 to 33. Though Jacob no longer had any holdings in Canaan, what instructions did he give his sons regarding his burial? Who else is buried in that cave? Why do you think Jacob made this request? Genesis 49, beginning at verse 29. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, there they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth, and when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. The Bible informs us that all three of the patriarchs and their wives were buried in the same cave. Jacob's trust in God was strong, and he considered himself a stranger and pilgrim on the earth, as we read in Hebrews 11 verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Despite mistakes, he left home with nothing, but came back to Canaan a wealthy man. And so to finish today, despite our mistakes, God can still bless us. 
How much better, however, to avoid the mistakes to begin with? What choices are you now facing, and how can you avoid making the wrong ones? Thursday, February 9. Moses in Egypt. The character of Moses dominated the early years of sacred history. He was kept alive in the providence of God who worked through an enterprising mother and a caring sister. When Pharaoh's daughter found baby Moses in the Ark of Bulrushes, she asked his Hebrew mother to care for him and paid her to do so. What a blessed challenge for a young mother who was in exile and slave. Jochebed had only twelve years to teach her child to pray, to trust and honour God, and shape his character for a life of service. For years Moses was trained in the royal courts of Egypt. And Moses, it says in Acts 7.22, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. As Moses matured as a man, he made a conscious decision that changed his life and the course of history. Read Hebrews chapter 11 verses 24 to 29. Think about what Moses left behind and what he had to face instead. Try to look at it from his position before he made the choice. What was he leaving and what was he choosing to accept by leaving? Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 24. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Egypt was one of the greatest powers in the ancient world at the time, if not the greatest. The Nile River created such fertile land that Egypt, flush with crops, was a wealthy and powerful nation and Moses himself would have been at the top of this kingdom. It's hard to imagine how tempting the lure of the world, the world of Egypt and all its treasures, must have been to him in his early years. Surely he must have found the adoration, the pleasures and the riches tempting. No doubt, he probably very easily could have justified staying rather than throwing in his lot with a bunch of despised slaves. And yet, what? As Scripture says, he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Hebrews 11.25 And talk about afflictions. A major part of the book of Exodus deals with the struggles and trials of Moses who even after all he went through, was still not able to cross over to the promised land, as you read in Numbers 20 and verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Yet, in the end, we all know that Moses made the right choice even if at times he must have wondered himself if he really had. And so to finish the day, from a worldly perspective, Moses should have stayed in Egypt. However, as Christians, we have been given a view of reality that takes us way beyond this world. When we are tempted by the world, how can we keep the big picture always before us? Why is it so important that we do so?
Friday, February 10. God honoured his part of the covenant by blessing Abraham, and Abraham honoured God by not storing up treasures on this earth. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 169, the heritage that God has promised to his people is not in this world. Abraham had no possession in the earth, no, not so much as to set his foot on, we read in Acts 7 verse 5. He possessed great substance, and he used it to the glory of God and the good of his fellow men, but he did not look upon this world as his home. The Lord had called him to leave his idolatrous countrymen with the promise of the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Yet neither he, nor his son, nor his son's son received it. When Abraham desired a burial place for his dead, he had to buy it of the Canaanites. His sole possession in the land of promise was that rock-hewn tomb in the cave of Machpelah. End of quote. As we live, we are sometimes tempted to go toward wealth and leisure. It takes strong faith to practice delayed gratification. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 246, we read, The magnificent palace of Pharaoh and the monarch's throne were held out as an inducement to Moses. But he knew that the sinful pleasures that make men forget God were in its lordly courts. He looked beyond the gorgeous palace, beyond the monarch's crown, to the high honours that will be bestowed on the saints of the Most High in a kingdom untainted by sin. He saw by faith an imperishable crown that the King of Heaven would place on the brow of the overcomer. This faith led him to turn away from the lordly ones of earth and join the humble, poor, despised nation that had chosen to obey God rather than to serve him. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. What will happen to our possessions when Jesus comes? Well, let's look at Second Peter 3 verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. In fact, what can happen to them even before Jesus comes? Matthew 6.20 But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Why then is it always important to keep things in the proper perspective? 2. Jesus warned about the deceitfulness of riches in Mark 4 verse 19. What is he talking about? How can riches deceive us? I'll read the whole verse, Mark 4 verse 19. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And question three in class, talk about the ways Moses might have justified staying in Egypt instead of leaving everything behind in order to flee with a bunch of slaves to a barren desert. What ultimately must have caused him to decide as he did. And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Miracle of a Mission School by Chifundo Kanjo Two very different kinds of mission schools shaped John Fieri's life. As a youth, John was sent from home in Malawi to study the family's non-Christian religion on the Indian Ocean island of Zanzibar. John spent three years immersed in the religion's main book and learning how to establish houses of worship in unentered areas of Africa. Finishing his education in Zanzibar, the young man was sent back to Malawi to lead two houses of worship. He also was tasked with closely monitoring local Christians and reporting his findings back to Zanzibar. To better understand Christianity, he was instructed to read a King James Bible. 
Over the next few years, John joined three different Christian churches, rising to a senior position in one of them as he collected information for Zanzibar. All the while, he led houses of worship in two Malawian towns. John's heart was touched as he read the Bible. He found it more understandable than his religion's book. He longed to know more about Jesus. Still a youth, he enrolled in the Seventh-day Adventist school at Luwazi Mission. For him, it was a new kind of mission school, very different from the school in Zanzibar. He was particularly interested in the school's Pathfinder Club, and he joined it, participating in all the programs. John fell in love with Jesus during a week of prayer at the school, and he gave his heart to Jesus in baptism. He stopped sending information to Zanzibar. John's father was furious when he found out. He angrily accused John's mother of being the cause, and he divorced her. Years passed, and John felt called by God to put his mission schooling to work. While he had been trained in Zanzibar to open houses of worship in unentered areas for his former religion, he resolved to take his Adventist education and do the same thing for Jesus. He became a global mission pioneer, an Adventist who establishes congregations in unentered areas within his own culture. John served as a global mission pioneer for 10 years, and many people from his family's religion gave their hearts to Jesus. John went on to graduate with a theology degree from Malawi, Adventist University, and today serves as an Adventist pastor. John said the Adventist mission school changed his life. Do not underestimate the importance of mission schools, he said. They are a tool for people to know Jesus and accept him as their personal saviour. Seventh-day Adventist education is very vital in preaching the gospel and making Christ known to all. You can learn more about Global Mission Pioneer online at bit.ly slash gmpioneer. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.